Chapter 4, Section 1, Overview of Protein Structure. Now, if you look, we're talking about how the amino acid sequence, the primary structure of a polypeptide, how it can go from literally a two-dimensional shape, it's just a string, and how we're going to get this into a correct shape so that it can have some function. That correct shape to have function is what is known as conformation. Conformation, as we see right here in this second bullet, is the shape, that three-dimensional shape, that's going to be thermodynamically the most stable. Okay, As I said in the intro to this chapter, these polypeptide strands, this primary structure, can fold in numerous, numerous ways. Longer the longer the amino acid sequence, the longer the, you know, the greater the potential ways it can fold. But they're not going to be stable. The free energy, the G, the delta G in them, is going to be quite high. So they're going to want, you know, to unravel because they cannot hold themselves. Too many forces within the structure is going to be trying to tear it apart. So you want to get to the correct folding pattern that's going to have the lowest free energy, most stability, and this is what we're going to call the native structure. Okay, The native protein. The protein is folded and functional. This is really important to get to this native conformation because of the stability. The amino acids have to be in the correct orientation and within such, you know, distance, relative distances that hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic interactions, ionic interactions can take over and help the folding of what we call the secondary level of structure. Now these hydrophobic effects, okay, keep in mind, this is the inability of the amino acid R groups to have any type of a charge or have any type of ionic capability of forming hydrogen bonds with water. Thus, they don't interact with water. No interaction, hydrophobic. This is going to be a bit of an issue. Many of the amino acids that a protein can or a polypeptide can be made of are not going to want to interact with water. Or even if they are ionic or you know charged, their interaction is going to be very weak. But we still have to have these proteins in solution. You cannot have in your cells, because remember, this is biochemistry, so everything we're talking about has to be able to occur in a cell. You cannot have proteins or any other biological macromolecules that have the inability to be in an aqueous solution, which is what your cells are. Everything in them, in the cytoplasm, in the organelles themselves, it's an aqueous solution. So for those proteins to be able to be in solution, even though they're going to be composed of a high number of hydrophobic amino acids, you know, those R chains are going to be extremely hydrophobic. The proteins are going to need to form what is known as a solvation layer. Okay, Solvation layer. In biology, in many of our courses, we refer to this as you know, the hydration layer. This solvation layer means that this protein somehow has to get enough water molecules, hydrogen bonding with the R groups of the amino acids that it's composed of, so that it can at least be pulled into solution. It may not be truly hydrophilic, may not be truly soluble in water, but you get enough of this hydration layer going, this solvation layer going, you can force it to occur. 
or at least mimic what a soluble protein would look like. When we look at these polypeptides, we notice that, yes, the primary structure is basically a two-dimensional thing. Okay, boom, not much going on there. But when we begin looking at polypeptides and their native conformation, we see that there's three-dimensional structure that's layered. You, have a th you go from two dimensions to a third dimension, and then that third dimension makes a, you know, builds on itself to make another level, three-dimensional level of higher order complexity. And then that comes, that level comes and makes another higher level of complexity. That's where we get the primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary structure idea. Well, so going from a two-dimensional thing to a three-dimensional, that secondary level of structure is where you're going to get these alpha helices and these beta sheets. Alpha helices, beta sheets. Okay. These three-dimensional structures, which are composed of that two-dimensional string, you're going to see that there's a lot of interactions going on of the R groups. You're going to get ion pairs, salt bridges, and hydrogen bonding occurring. How tightly these things are going to be bound together? Well, it's going to be dependent upon what solution they're in. A polar aqueous solvent, water, or a water solution. You know, the dielectric constant of 80, some nonpolar thing going on. Much, much lower. The van der Waals interactions, which we've talked about, you get two things and you force them close enough together. Even if there's no hydrogen bonding or ionic bonding, just the close proximity, any dipole is going to start interacting. So it may not be a true ionic or a hydrogen bond, but you force the, them close enough together. You meet that radii that, you know, that we talked about in chapter in the previous chapter you can force two molecules to interact i mean you look at this distance here 0.3 to 0.6 nanometers covalent bond if you remember is 0 0.09 hydrogen bond is 1.7 i believe it was that we discussed in a previous lecture so it's not as tight as the covalent or the hydrogen it's over a greater distance thus a weaker interaction weaker interaction that again, one of the bonds is not that strong, but the things are cumulative, just like we've talked about previously with hydrogen bonds. We have two simple rules so far that we need to look at. We need to make sure that any proteins we are talking about follow. First being, you wanna have as many hydrophobic residues. This term residue. Okay, whenever you see that in biochemistry, especially when we're talking proteins, think amino acid, okay? So the hydrophobic amino acids, hydrophobic residues, tomato, tomato, are gonna be largely buried in the protein interior away from water. Again, you have this globular protein. If the amino acids and their R groups, those residues that are on the surface are hydrophobic, you're not gonna get that solvent or that hydration layer occurring, things aren't going to be pulled into solution. So you need to have some hydrophobic amino acids, yes. Okay. What you want to do is you want to bury them in the center, okay, near the middle of your protein. By burying in the middle, excluding all the water out, boom. It's going to help lock in some of that structure. The native conformation, the one that's the most stable, you're going to see the greatest number of hydrogen bonds, ionic interactions, van der Waals interactions, and so on and so forth. The maximum number giving you the most stable 
conformation, the most stable shape. The peptide bond is rigid, okay, and forms planes. You see here, amino acid residue one, it's alpha carbon, amino acid residue two, it's alpha carbon. Carbon, carboxyl group of amino acid one, the amino group of amino acid two, it's alpha carbon. A little hard to draw on here, but for some reason, this carbon nitrogen is going to be shorter going to be drawn in closer. That's a little hard to see behind my head, but if you look at in the textbook at this figure here, you'll see, well here, let me see if I can turn this off for a minute. You'll see, here's that alpha carbon one, alpha carbon two, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, carbon. Okay. Negative up here, positive-ish down here at the nitrogen. Okay, especially when you get this carbon double bond, carbon nitrogen thing occurring. Where's this double bond coming from? Well, it's here from this, what is now a carbonyl. Boom. Carbon, boom, switches over. So it's now double bond here. This charge resonates back and forth, back and forth between the nitrogen and the carbon. They are now an electron short, proton heavy. Boom, 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 boom. So that double bond goes away. Now one of them gets it, the other's short, and it goes back and forth, back and forth. But even while this resonance is going on, what we see here is this plane between neighboring alpha carbons, carbon, alpha carbon, carbon, nitrogen, alpha carbon, amino acid one, amino acid two, alpha, carbon, nitrogen, alpha, alpha, carbon, nitrogen, alpha, okay? Amino acid one, I'm sorry, amino acid one here, two here, three, four, five. Mistakenly said in the first lecture, in the intro tape lecture, hey, remember in the lecture I said this? For those of you who aren't, hadn't, didn't watch it or you're reviewing, imagine this point right here is the alpha carbon. This point there, now you can see it hopefully, this point. Here's one plane coming off it, here's the other. Now, this angle never changes. That's rigid. What does change is the rotation of the planes. The planes can rotate. But that angle you see there with the alpha carbon right here, that angle never changes. Remember we've said in the previous chapter, the alpha carbon in an amino acid can act as a chiral center. That's what we were referring to. We see the angles or the rotation angles. Okay, this angle stays. The rotation angle means how are that how is that plane rotating? We call phi and psi. Phi is going to be the, the amino to the alpha carbon. Psi is the alpha carbon to the carboxyl carbon. How are they rotating? Notice here, phi psi up here, phi psi, phi psi here. This phi does not have to equal that phi, does not have to equal that phi. The only angle that will always be the same is this angle right there, this angle, that angle. That angle will never change. The rotation 
how those planes rotate, that can be different amino acid to amino acid. And we measure the angles in 180 degree arcs. Zero, 180 plus. If you're going clockwise, you're going, you're going counterclockwise from zero, negative 60, negative 80. And that's why it says plus minus 180 there. So, okay, we can have this. And the two phi psi angles do not have to be the same. Even though I keep doing it like this, that's just because I'm old, I'm stupid, and I can't rub my head and rub my belly at the same time. So you can have them at different angles. They can move, conformation can change, depending upon what's happening to the polypeptide. But this angle, coming off the alpha carbon, that never